be here. Thank you so much for taking your time to come learn more about how we can distribute and pass the important message to our constituents, to our customers, to our friends, to our legislators that Kentucky homes matter. Um, I can't think of, I saw a video this morning produced by NAR that talked about for the first time, or maybe not for the first time, but for the first time in a long while, home ownership uh, due to economic conditions can be threatened. And also when we look at potential legislative initiatives that tax services or reduce or eliminate things like the mortgage interest deduction, not only does it affect your bottom line, it also affects the local, state, and national economies. One thing as realtors that I am so proud to represent KAR uh, about is that we don't just go to the legislature to ask for money. We don't go to the legislature just on behalf of our selfish ambition. We go to support our communities. We go to support our economies. Certainly that means uh, assisting realtors in, in having policy that is advantageous to them, but in turn, that helps the economy. So I don't have to tell you about the importance of home ownership. What we wanted to do, uh, President John May made this our priority for this year, and coming, the coming up legislative session, we wanted to have a focus on protecting Kentucky homes and the real estate markets in Kentucky. With that, I wanted to introduce John McCarthy. He's the founding and managing partner of McCarthy Strategic Solutions. He has more than 20 years of experience in political campaigns and corporate and government relations. He served as chairman of the Republican Party of Kentucky in 2004, and under his leadership, they made significant gains in both federal and state levels. Since 2005, he's managed his own lobbying firm based in Frankfurt, and he has been working with the Kentucky Association for almost a year now. He, is a, he leads a bipartisan team to represent our interests to key leaders in Frankfurt, and he is an integral part of our team, and on top of that, he's a nice guy. So with that, I would introduce to you Colin's brother. Well, thank you for having me here today. We're excited to be part of the uh, Kentucky Association of Realtors and the efforts here and to be in front of the Lexington Board of Realtors. Um, you know, the, the, the goal here today is to introduce you to Kentucky Homes Matters, the grassroots advocacy campaign, and to walk through that step by step, hopefully, hopefully give you some tools. Really, it's refreshers for most of you that have been active in the past. I see a lot of familiar politically active faces in this here this morning, and um, and I think it's a refresher there, but it's also to hone our message. And also, we're going to have the opportunity here from our friend Senator Tom Buford that really helps us, um, you know, kind of galvanize that message about what works, um, because we can, you know, we can. If it's not going to work, we don't want to do it. So, um, so let's get rolling here. Let's talk about the political climate that we're currently in, because you can throw a message to, towards a dark board, but if the dark board is going to, you know, I mean, it, it, if it's not going to resonate with legislators because they're just off in another world or they're focused on another priority, but the political climate is that it's very, very uh, motivated by the politics. Um, I would say it always has been, but I would say more than ever, um, because you have the, you know, 55, 45, 55 Democrats, 45 Republicans in the House, um, which that margin's never going into an election cycle, going in through a legislative session. You've never had the numbers that tight, um, and uh, specifically on a budget session. Um, you also have the current environment over there. What's going on of last last two weeks? Uh, since the special session, no one really knows where that's going to end up, but it obviously has not been a positive. Um, and so anytime there's a pressure where the public has a, just an additional reason not to like the legislative process, it just adds more political pressure uh, on folks. Over in the Senate, um, you know, you have a uh, first-time leadership team. Uh, this is going to be their first true budget session, and then also through the their election cycle, the, the Senate Republicans have 14 of their incumbents that are up for re-election. Um, you know, there's uh, redistricting, the entire maps for both the House and Senate are new. Um, I would say the majority of members uh, had to see some sort of change, and some had significant change. Um, and they're gonna have to get to know counties that they've never run in before. Um, you know, uh, Senator Buford, you didn't change any counties you didn't lose or you pick up any counties, did you? I played Boyle for Washington and Mercer. Got it. So he'll be spending a lot more time in 
Springfield than he will be in Danville um, in, in the future. So um, that's an example about what their priorities are going to be between now and then through the session and then through election cycle. Of course, we really won't know what the true landscape looks like from a political climate until we get to late January, and that's the filing deadline. And once we have the filing deadline, everybody knows whether we're going to have a primary race or whether we have a general. You can kind of settle into what the what the policy initiatives are, that are going to take root um, in the general assembly in 2014 legislative session. Any questions about the political climate or political overview? Plus, you also need to know that there's this little Senate U.S. Senate election that's going on. Um, you know that that's probably going to drive up voter turnout. Um, because there's going to be more money spent in Kentucky than there ever has been on a political race. Um, and even more than any close presidential elections. You know, if I don't remember, you, you, how many of you remember the last first Clinton uh, election when he got elected in 92? I mean, Kentucky was a hot, was hot and heavy right in the middle of it. Um, it really hasn't been since then, quite honestly. But this U.S. Senate race will have a very interesting dynamic. And in how? But it'll, it'll raise the voter turnout, we, we believe, just because of the number of dollars that are going to be spent. Um, and so what does that mean to the state legislative races? And uh, you know, it's going to have a positive effect in some areas uh, to folks that are in favor of our issue. And it's going to have a negative impact to folks that are in favor of our issue. But the bottom line is, we got to find, we hope that everybody who runs is in favor of our issue and is in our position, uh, regardless. So, that's another big impact on the political climate uh, in Kentucky. The, you have a congressional race here in the 6th Congressional District that will probably be uh, contested. There's already, uh, I think, uh, a Democrat challenger. I don't think he's drawn any primary <coughs> challenger in Congressman Barr, but this is his first election. And so whenever you have a, a freshman member of Congress run, they're usually a challenge. And uh, we'll see how that race plays out at this point in time. Um, you know, uh, I think you know, Andy Barr has probably done, hasn't done anything to get fired over, but you just never know about the political climate and as it relates to the, all, again, the larger U.S. Senate race and what's going on nationally um, over there. 2000 legislative session, what's going to be the biggest priority and the biggest message they're going to talk about is the budget. I mean, the budget is the drives, I would say, 75, 80 percent of most decision making over there especially in a, in a budget year. You're talking about 2014, July, to 2016, all the spending priorities for the Commonwealth for the next two years. Um, you're looking at 2% growth, uh, according to the consensus, latest consensus forecast group. That is not very much growth. That doesn't mean, that doesn't keep up with the rate of inflation when you talk about Medicaid and adding 300,000 people to Medicaid rolls. It doesn't mean the correction population for the first time probably hasn't grown, that cost probably hasn't grown as much as it has in the past, but it's still growing. Um, you know, other administrative costs still continue to go up at a much higher rate than 2%. And this is the first time they'll have the obligation of the money coming right off the top going to pensions. And, and I don't know how you saw that the pension uh, situation in Kentucky may be actually far worse than we anticipated. There was a $70 billion number thrown out last week. Um, so pensions is going to be driving a lot. The, everything I've just mentioned, though, you could lay out the, the framework and groundwork that we need more money or you need a cut on the other side. And I really think that's how this session is going to frame up. Um, and then how do they get more money? Well, gaming. Uh, there's been the governor's initiative on tax reform, which we've done studies on. We've got our message out there last session. And we're going to continue to do that. We, I really believe that that will be part of the debate. Um, there will be other policy initiatives that will come forward as well. Uh, but the budget will drive the majority of the legislative session. And I would imagine there will probably be a formal bill that will set out some standards for the LRC uh, and what they're supposed to do and not to do in certain situations going forward. What do you think, Tom? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so we'll talk a little bit more about the legislative session. Any other comments about the legislative session? The members that are currently elected today <coughs> and in serving today will be serving through January. They'll be January through April 15th. So that won't change unless somebody decides to step down on their own. Um, so uh, there's no elections this fall that will change that at, at this point in time. So 
Um, that's good, because you guys already know who your targets are, and our target isn't going to change <coughs> from now through April 15th or even until next November. Um, we'll go from there. Tax reform efforts. Um, you know, the governor had the Bluegrass Commission. We had realtors at the majority of those meetings. We've done our own study that came out that demonstrated that really didn't see the, the net impact, a positive impact of all the recommendations that were coming out. And really what they developed was a list of where to go tax. Um, they didn't really talk about total reform on, there's some repeals in there for specific industries and things like that, but the offset really didn't kind of come out when they, they talk about raising an additional 300 to $400 million with these reforms. Well, who was gonna pay for that? You know, who's gonna pay for those dollars? And if you look at some of those suggestions that were made, one of those that was in there was the mortgage interest deduction and capping that. Um, they even talked about that this session. And, um, you know, basically what we're looking at is trying to make sure that people know that it doesn't matter if you cap it at a million dollars, it's still not a good message to send about home ownership. Everything we talk about with tax reform, we're going to ask the question of legislators, is that good for home ownership? Is that the right thing to do to promote home ownership? Now, maybe there is some tax reform we want that would promote uh, home ownership, you know, that could possibly be moved through the process. But just remember, for everywhere you probably create a better environment, they are always going to look for a way to pay for that. Because usually a better tax environment means you're going to pay less, you know, or you're going to pay it differently. Um, and so we've got to be smart about where we position ourselves going forward on and be flexible uh, on that as that comes down. But as of right now, our main message is about the mortgage introduction. Any kind of cap on that is our biggest concern. Then we also have the sales tax on services or sales tax on uh, different uh, different assets that currently aren't paying a sales tax. What is that ripple effect through <coughs> the purchase of a home? What is the ultimate cost today versus what the cost will be tomorrow? Um, and uh, or in the future, if you go to that sort sort of tax uh, policy, uh, is there going to be an offset someplace else if you increase the sales tax out there? Is there going to be you know you are small businesses? What benefit is that going to be to you if you're having to pay more for your accounting fees, but yet you're paying less taxes someplace else? You know all that's going to have to be defined, and I would say right now it is all over the map that there is not one real solid um, direction because really it has to be led by the governor. Um, if, the, if this is going to happen, the governor is really going to have to step forward and make this a mantle from now until uh, January. And uh, what's been kind of interesting is now we're at you know, September the 9th, and I, by now I would have thought that there would then start to be a conversation. You would hear the governor start communicating some sort of message um, on, on this kind of broader themes of what's coming up with the session. And the only thing so far that he's really talked about is, is defending the, the, the decision <coughs> to move forward on Medicaid expansion, um, which is a big decision. It's a huge decision. Um, and it does merit, you know, if he believes in it and that's what he wants to do, he needs to get out and educate that because the General Assembly ultimately will have to make a decision as to whether to appropriate those funds or not on Medicaid expansion. And so that could be the big, big, big issue as well this session. But if you look three years down the road, that's when we really are going to need the revenue to take care of Medicaid. So why not have that conversation today about how we're going to pay for it down the road? And that's where tax reform could come in. That's where gaming could come in. And that's where other issues could come in. So that kind of lays the groundwork for where we sit. Does anybody have any questions about any of those first three step, first, first three parts before I move on? Yes, sir. Am I correct that the uh, it's about twelve thousand dollars per person, man, woman, and child for our shortfall? Uh, right now, yeah. I've heard that similar number. Yes. Thank you. I mean the budget, the budget, the budget is there, but the, the uh, on pensions alone, the number I like to give out is that if we spent not another nickel on anything else in our $18 billion budget, you know, it would take us 16 years to fill the complete, to, to fill that gap. 
to where our pension obligations are. Now, that's the whole gap. That's if everybody cashes out today. So the reality is you have a percentage of that, 25% or something or even less than that, that you have to have going forward. And they'll just manage that the best they can. And the cost of capital for the state governments is still super, super low, you know, um, what they can borrow money from. And so um, as long as they have cash flow, they'll, they'll borrow up to the, to the level. Our debt limit in the state is probably more of a concern. And I would imagine you'll see both sides start talking what our, about what our borrowing capacity is in the future. Because that really is how our, the, the, the baseline of our state budget is not is the cash flow and then how much we can borrow. Um, because we don't have, if you said today, you know, I want all the cash out of the state government, it's already obligated, you know, um, and they work on, it's, it's purely on the debt, you know, debt situation that we run the state government on. And that's not unique. It, all state governments kind of run that way, except for maybe the state of Indiana where they just paid off a half a billion dollars um, in debt. So that will be a very big question uh, in the session. It's all part of this tax reform. It's all part of the budget um, and where the priorities are going forward. Yes, ma'am. Are we going to be getting any money from the federal government to help with Obamacare with that expansion? Yes, ma'am. They, they, and also, one other thing that I think is not being looked at in the state is, is bringing in new businesses, supporting the businesses we have, the great economy for our tax base increases. I don't see a lot of activity that way. I see it more directed towards uh, gambling, gaming, which to me is just reshuffling all that money. So what? What are we doing? Well, I mean, the governor, the governor actually, if you look at the numbers, we, the numbers are actually pretty good on the advanced manufacturing related jobs. We're not, what's not produced after that is the residual white collar sort of jobs that come from the, what I would say the manufacturing jobs that are there. So the, there is that. Yes, the federal government is going to fund 100% of the Medicaid expansion for the next three years. After three years, it drops down to where they only pay 70%, which right now today on Medicaid, the state pays 30%, the federal government pays 70%. So for three years, we're gonna pay 100%, and then we pay, we have to pick up that 30%. And that's the, what I call the cliff, that's gonna be out there in the future on, as it relates to what's, the state pays in Medicaid. Plus you have, the government does pay for the, uh, um, which many of your employees might see as an option, is the health exchange. The federal government's paid, I think it's $60 million so far, then they'll continue to run that to set up and manage the health uh, exchange, of which a lot of small employers and a lot of indiv individual uh, folks will get their, will access the insurance market through that exchange. So those are two ways the federal government's going to pay to answer your question. Yes? Well, actually, um, your first point about manufacturing in this, this state, it's declining. It is not. It is not increasing. Well, I, what I, if you listen to what the governor's office is focusing and touting the number of the manufacturing jobs that they are bringing in. And so based on that information, I don't have a good handle. How about handle. the ones that are leaving? I don't have a good handle on that. All I know is about the, well, is the, the numbers that are coming that, in. That would solve our problem if we, we actually got more tax revenue from jobs that people active. And, I, and I, I would say you're absolutely right and that there's going to be this debate about how does Kentucky compete with Indiana, Tennessee, Illinois, our surrounding states as it relates to jobs and the type of jobs that we're bringing in. Um, and I, I fully expect that to be debated. And I think that tax reform for raising more money's sake probably isn't that popular as it is tax reform for creating jobs and bringing jobs. Because that's really what is going to be beneficial in the long run. Um, but they have to decide, the legislature has to decide those priorities. Our, our goal is to get ourselves stuck in the middle of this debate or not even be in it at all. I mean, we would love to not even be in this conversation, period. If we do our job right and 
every legislator then understands well, we don't want to touch mortgage interest deduction is gone. You know, sales tax on services that directly impact the real estate marketplace, we don't want that that's not gonna fly. It, we we're we're not in that. Um, and here's why. Here's why it matters to home ownership. That's our goal uh, going forward. So um, in Kentucky homes do matter. I mean they're the the cornerstone of the most, uh, every economic indicator is the job support and home, home sales, right? And what's the rate of home growth, home sales, new home starts? Those are, every national person talks about that. So, you know, if we're not doing things to help that, help home ownership in the Commonwealth of Kentucky, then what, 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 what are we doing to help the economy? Just like, ma'am, you, you talked about what are we doing to help create jobs, you know, real new jobs. Um, you know, I think all of that has to be played up against each other. Okay, Kentucky Association really is the voice for real estate in the General Assembly. They, they were a trusted voice. People readily, the elected officials, understand who you are. When you say realtor, they usually put a face to it immediately. They know at least one, at least maybe more. And then we have a few members that are actually are uh, in, the, in the, that are our realtors, and that's helpful. Um, you know, every, we talked about this already, that everything you could possibly do to communicate our message to your elected official, we talked about happening over a period of time. So if you look from today until January, and then January through April, as basically the first quarter and second quarter of the game, you know, as many times as we can get in front of them with credible time value information and events, the better off we're gonna be. Um, and, uh, you know, whether that's a fundraiser for, the, for them, or whether that's just a face-to-face -face meeting over a cup of coffee, but you're talking about the policy issues, uh, whether that's a group of realtors getting together um, to meet with that, that person. Maybe it's a, a client or a customer that has a ribbon cutting opportunity of which you're involved with the legislator getting to come to that event. That's totally unrelated to any policy issue whatsoever. It's just the fact that you're giving them a, an opportunity to be seen <coughs> in a positive way in their community and you're the, perp you're the reason for that. I mean, those are all things you, you should do. Writing, writing letters to the editor, writing communications, giving them good hard facts. When we send them out to you, getting those to, getting those to your members, it's a lot more meaningful, and Senator Buford can address this, uh, a letter coming from a constituent with the facts than it is from the lobbyist with the facts. Right, Senator? Absolutely. It just is, so uh, just remember that. Um, <laughs> We talked about how tax reform should encourage home ownership and not discourage it. Um, and, and that is a, a theme that I think is easily understood by most legislators. And then they ask, well, get into the specifics. What are you talking about? And then that's when we have to be able to explain to them that the, when we cap the mortgage interest deduction at a total of $30,000 um, a year, that that is going to add, you know, push Homeownership, homeowners out. It's gonna, it's gonna basically have people make a decision that, uh, based on the tax policy, that it's not gonna be good for homeownership. Um, you know, the additional sales tax on the services that you have to pay or that the, your homeowner has to pay just adds to the cost of business, adds to the overall cost. Those are the two messages that we're gonna keep repeating and repeating. Um, and we talked about how home ownership is critical to our communities and to the economy. Um, how do you send out a, uh, something to your uh, other, other realtors in your firm or uh, you know, people who your most your best clients, just about the state of the economy and how important home ownership is to that? How many of you guys do that? I would encourage you to think about that as a marketing tool. Be relevant with your conversation to your customers if there is something that you put out in a mailing and that sort of thing. Use, our, use the materials you get from KAR, from the Lexington folks, and start, start doing that. Um, it's a good way of building up support 
And um, they already trust you with one of their biggest assets, and that was the purchase of their home, right? Or purchase of their property. And so if you're sending them a message directly about what impacts your business and may impact them in the future, you know, if they've already trusted you with the, large, with the purchase of the largest asset that most people have, most likely they're going to listen to what you have to say from a general assembly standpoint or issue, right? So don't ever be afraid to, to use that network that you have. Your Rolodex is 10 times more powerful than if I call everybody that, that you know, you know? You calling those people and then, or you communicating them in some way, form, or fashion. I would think about that over the next nine months. You know, how do I make my sphere of influence bigger, right? I mean, it's like a basketball player when he puts his elbows out, sticks his butt out, he's much bigger <laughs> than he is than just this. It's the same deal with your sphere of influence. How many of you all do like regular speeches or talks to uh, community forums like Kiwanis clubs or things like that? Al, you've done it? That's great. You've done it? Do it. Do it again. It has to get on the agenda. I, th I think the thing about Cindy now, I was thinking when you first asked that about letters, but I, I see more of it from the realtor community with social media uh, that's more prominent than just uh, you know sending letters or something like that out to their clients. Yeah, I mean, the social media is, is great. Um, all, any, any avenue that you're comfortable communicating with your you're, you know your audience better than, than I do. Some people like letters. Some people like the, the, the emails. Some people like the f putting it on Facebook and having that happen. We're going <laughs> to give you the tools to use all those, whatever you're comfortable with. The idea is that you'll expand your area of influence. Going back to public forums, you know, if there's a Kiwanis Club, there's a community meeting in your neck of the woods, ask to get on the agenda if you're comfortable speaking in front of that group about these issues. That's a tremendous way to get a large audience in a short period of time, um, or a larger audience in a short period of time. Uh, any of those type of steps, if you can think about in a monthly, in your month, and how you spend your time over each month, right? How much time would you be willing to commit to this effort? You know, is it one day? You know, that's one 24 hours out of a month, that's a lot of time. Is it one hour a week, you know? Um, <coughs> But I would really think about that because the more time you put into it, the better impact we're going to have. And we're going to need your help on executing this plan by the biggest commitment is going to be your time um, and resources. Um, quality of the communication is important. You know, I think our one pager here, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute, but it's one page. Short, sweet, they can get it, they understand. It'll give Tom Buford some quick facts he can rattle off when he talks about our issue on the floor of the Senate. If it ever had, hopefully it never happens. Or in committee, hopefully it never happens. Um, but that's the, um, we want to be short, concise, and the quality of your communication, if you, even if you have somebody who disagrees with you, the goal there is to leave that meeting in a positive way. Um, you've shared your ideas. Remember, it's no, there's no reason really to get angry because we want long-term relationships <coughs> with these members. We want that one-to-one -one because there's going to be some issue at some point in time where that member remembers that meeting, they remember the critical information, they're going to call you and ask you a question. That's what you want to have happen. Right? You want to become their trusted resource. How many of you can name the five people in your life that if they called you up and asked you to do something, you'd say yes immediately? Think about that. Right? I mean, everybody's got those five or six people. If they call and ask you something immediately, I'd do it. Well, ultimately, you want to be one of those five to the, to the, the elected officials. Um, and if we can accomplish that over a period of time, you're, especially when it comes to your subject, your topic area, they want, you know, um, that's what you want to become, is their trusted resource for information, whether it's pro or con. You know, um, you want to become that trusted issue. And that's how you build those long-term, valuable um, relationships. How many people that know a legislator has their cell phone number? That's pretty good. Today, cell phone numbers are important. I'm going to change my number. No. <laughs> well, I'm not going to give it out. <laughs> um, 
but that's to me that's the that's the used to be hey you know where do you see him on the weekends it's still important to go see him you're going to see him in church you're going to see him at you know at the McDonald's you're going to see him or whatever the local community gathering places are you're going to see him um, but getting that cell phone number is really important email address is really important you know and then um, as many face to face contacts as you can make is always important. Educate, educate, every, take every opportunity. We've talked about this a little bit, but literally it ought to be once a month from now on, or maybe twice a month as we get close to the session, where you're looking for an opportunity to educate that elected official about our issue. You know, um, and when they say, okay, I got it, we don't need to chat anymore, I'm with you 100%, you know, you're solid, or then say, okay, well then, what are you hearing out there from other members? What's the conversation about? And then feed that back to us. Because sometimes talking to the members in that discourse gives us the best information about where we need to go target our efforts. Right? Um, so also, we talked about engaging local business leaders around. Realtors are a hub of many of these organizations. Um, and uh, so reach out to your chambers. Reach out to your business associations and ask for those opportunities to educate them uh, about our issue. And it actually impacts them as well. And then I would, if you are in a place that has a weekly newspaper or a, even an everyday newspaper, you know, and you feel comfortable enough talking to those folks, do it. Um, feel free to communicate with them. That's how they learn about the issues. They learn the pros and cons. It's not because, and I tell you, in the media, they get so many different information coming at them, they're going to respond to the phone call that they recognize first. They're going to respond to that more often than not. And a lot of times, uh, you know, well, anytime we send out something to you that's a press release, take that, turn around, email it directly to that member of the media that you know. You, Joe, you know that. It works really well when you get, right, when you were in, the, in that business, who'd you call back first? Oh, I, we would call back the, the, the people, the, the friend. Right. <laughs> that's right. The, the people that you know. So um, I think that's really important for us to also utilize this tool because a lot of other organizations don't have the training and the background that a lot of you guys have had over the years of being experienced on delivering these messages. And if you stick to the script that we give you, it makes it really easy. If they ask a tough question you can't answer, you say, I, you know, I don't know, but let me get back to you. Write down the question, call Anita, call me, call others and we'll get a response back for you.